So um, I appreciate you guys. This post-lunch um, after student slot is not very enviable, actually. Um, I really appreciated hearing from the students. And um, let me just tell you a little bit about our story. So I went to graduate school for my PhD at LSU, Louisiana State University. Um, my second year there, here comes this girl from Canada named Danae. That's her. <laughs> if you guys haven't noticed, I'm not from Canada. <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you might be able to tell a little bit. I'm from Arkansas, actually, born and raised. So we met there in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and became lifelong best friends. So we just had our 20-year best friend anniversary. I know. Um, the cool thing, oh, thanks. I ended up actually following her to Vancouver to do my internship. So I got to spend a year in Canada, which I, um, if I could live there forever, I would. I just can't afford it, <laughs> as you guys know. So I uh, got a job at Missouri State, and then there was another job the next year that opened. And I begged Danae to apply. She's going to stay in Vancouver for her career. Um, I begged her to apply because she could get a free trip to come see me if she got an interview. <laughs> she gets a free trip and comes to see me and takes the job. <laughs> and so I, we've had the luck of working next door with my best friend for the last uh, 16 years. So now you're jealous and that was the goal. So um, that's our story and then we did actually go down this whole like write a book together project and one of Danae's biggest fears when we signed that contract was that we might get a friendship divorce. Um, over the book, um, but I'm glad to say we're still we're still going, <laughs> not a single problem. So that's our background story. Um, what we're gonna what I'm gonna talk about today, and then Danae's gonna follow up. Um, I'm really talking about the science of learning because I don't know about you guys. I'm even in the field of psychology, but I was never taught how to teach. I did my PhD in this like really esoteric area of clinical psychology and eating disorders, body image, and obesity. I know a lot about that. That's actually one page of that book, by the way. One page. <laughs> so um, I know a lot about that, but I did not know a lot about teaching, and yet I was just thrown in um, to teach all these classes. And so at some point um, in around 2010 or so, um, we embarked on this whole project to redesign our whole introductory psychology program. And through that process, kind of got obsessed with the science of teaching and learning. And now that's actually what all our research is and that's what we focus on. And it's super exciting now to feel like I'm making a difference. I don't think those publications that I have about body checking behaviors are really making a difference in the world. But actually I have 330 students in my intro psych class every semester and I'm making a difference in their world. And so it feels really um, powerful and meaningful. So some questions that we have to understand when we're talking about student learning is if you don't know how people learn, then how are you gonna design a class that maximizes their learning abilities? So that's the most important thing. And there's lots of great resources out there. So I'm gonna throw some titles up there for you that should be on your shelf because um, they've made such a huge difference for us. So how learning works, a lot of the concepts that I'm gonna talk about today are in Make It Stick which is an excellent book. Um, small teaching, um, and you already saw this one on the big screen today. So these are some great resources with cognitive science at the backbone. So we know how the brain works, we just don't often translate that into the classroom. And so today, I always like to give you guys um, a warning of where we're going, and believe me, I'm gonna try to keep it brief because I got a 30 minute slot. I'm gonna talk about five principles of learning that you can apply in your classroom um, and really think about with your students and teach your students. Um, it was Puya over here who said something that I was like, oh yes, that's perfect. He's like, we need to learn how to learn. And I think that's part of our job as educators is not just teaching them content, but teaching them how to learn. And these five principles are things that I bring up over and over and over in my class. When they wanna know, why are you doing this a certain way? I'm like, oh, that's the best question ever. Here's why I'm doing it this way. So we're gonna actually start out with what doesn't work. <laughs> we're gonna go backwards for a second. I wish the students were in here because they, they, they responded so beautifully to this. But you all can put on your student hat. Pretend you're a student. What do you think of these strategies are students most likely to indicate they use? What do they use? What do they do to prepare? Review their notes. Rereading, highlight, okay, good job. Those are the top three. In fact, in one study, a recent study, 84% of students reported that they engage in rereading, which kind of threw me because I was like, rereading? Doesn't that imply like reading to begin with? I was like, I don't know if 84% of my students were ever reading actually, but that's what they say they're doing. 
So rereading, highlighting, and reviewing the notes. And that's almost what our student panel said, except for Maria, because I was loving me some Maria. Um, she had some great ideas um, that were really effective based on Cognoscience. But that's what our panels are, and believe me, those are the cream of the crop sitting up here, right? This is what they are doing. Here's the problem. The research suggests is those are highly ineffective study strategies. They don't work. You can spend a lot of time doing them, but they're not very effective. So uh, one study showed that these three things combined were not actually correlated with exam scores. Now, you may not be a psychologist, but you know a correlation should exist between whatever you're doing and what your exam score is, <laughs> right? And it should be high and it should be positive if we're doing things that actually work. So these are not effective. And so what's happening is our students, our hardworking students, are spin kind of spinning the wheel, their time on the wheel. They aren't doing things that are effective. So why are they choosing this? They're, these are good students. Why are they choosing these things? They don't know any better. Anything else? And we don't know any better. <laughs> we don't know what else to tell them. It's probably easier as well. I think this is critical here. These things are comfort what I always call comfortable and easy strategies. Highlighting. Think about that, right? You can be opening your book, you've got your, you can even have colors of highlighters, and you can be doing all kinds of pretty things, but it's not very cognitively taxing, right? So it is easy and it is comfortable, but here's the problem. Learning is not easy and it is uncomfortable. <laughs> when is the last time you learned something new, something you did not know, um, or something, some skill you didn't know how to do, where you thought, oh, this is easy, I don't even have to think about this. Usually if I'm learning something, I always say, this is what my face is looking like. I'm kind of doing this like, oh, okay, right? Learning is actually effortful and difficult and can be uncomfortable. If your study strategies are not making you feel that way, you're probably not maximizing your time. So another research study also showed that total time spent studying was not predictive of exam scores either. So we need to help our students. They don't have time to be wasting on ineffective strategies. So we know that these are not as effective. Um, one of the things that Maria talked about fits so beautifully into um, a deeper processing model we're gonna talk about, the idea of, of writing your own questions. That's hard. It's a lot harder than a flashcard, um, but it's actually way more effective in terms of learning. The last thing I wanna say that doesn't work, and hopefully I'm speaking to the, to the um, choir here about this, learning styles, it's just, it's just the myth that will not die. <laughs> so um, I'm on Twitter and every once in a while there's like a Twitter fight about this, someone else posts something about learning styles and then everybody piles on them. But I taught our intro level like first year experience class one year and it was in the book. So I had a chapter on learning styles and I was like, oh, this is not good. So learning styles, if you're not familiar with this whole thing, is the idea that there's a particular way in which people learn better. Some people are kinesthetic learners, some people are visual learners. And you need to match your instruction to their particular learning style in order for them to learn best. It's a beautiful theory. In fact, 90% of our undergraduate psychology students believe that it is true. Um, and here's another example where believing something to be true doesn't make it true. And so, in fact, there's zero evidence to suggest this is true. So um, matching learning style and instruction style is not an effective way um, to get students to learn. Um, in fact, I think we do our students a disservice to give them that idea that that's what, the, what they need to do. I always imagine us sending people out into the workforce um, and they're at a job and their boss tells them to do something. They're like, I'm sorry, I'm not an auditory learner. Could you write that down for me? They do say that. <laughs> like, this is crazy. We cannot be teaching our students this. So uh, I always use the hashtag learn all styles. <laughs> like, we need to be learning in all styles, and we need to tell our students that this is a myth. So making sure they understand that this is not true and that there's no evidence to back it up is important. So now are my five. So we're going to start with space versus mass practice. We call it distributed practice in psychology. I don't think anyone here is unaware of this, right? Um, at least intuitively, you're not unaware of this. This graph is on my slides. Um, we actually spend time in class going over how to learn. And this, I put this graph up there every time to point this out. And I don't do it right before an exam. I start at the beginning and talk to them about planning out their, their schedule of, of studying. If you keep study time equal, 
people who spread their, their practice sessions out over time will do better. This is the way our brain works. So you can study for 30 minutes and spread that out over six or seven sessions versus studying for four hours. But what do our students do? When do they study for their test? Even someone else said, I could stay up all night studying, and I was like, no, that's not going to work. Right? So our students are massing their practice, which is to their disadvantage. So if there's anything we can do, obviously talking about this effect is really powerful. They need to know about it. They need to be hearing it from you left and right. And then if there's a way you can structure your class so that they are forced to space their practice. I'm all about forcing students to do things that are good for them. Okay, so number two is retrieval practice. So this is also called the testing effect. I would say in the literature um, of scholarship of teaching and learning, this is the most robust effect. So the idea is that we get used to, and our students get used to the idea that there's a learning period and then there's a testing period. So they're learning and then they take a test. When in fact, testing as part of the learning process actually improves learning more so than almost any other activity students can engage in. So taking practice tests actually helps students consolidate and learn that information more so than doing other things like rereading, studying, trying to review their notes. So this graph right here that's up here is actually showing you what happens. So the, gr the group in the um, black bar are people who studied for a certain amount of time and they were given another period of time where they studied again. Times being equal, the, the gray bar are people who studied first and then took a practice test. In a one, sorry, five minute inter recall interval, actually the study study group kind of outperformed the study test group. And that's why people end up doing this, the study study. It feels like you're learning more. But if you look at two days and up to a week, which is when we actually test people, <laughs> we don't test them five minutes after class, we test them next week in class, you actually see the people who studied and then took a practice test do significantly better than people who studied and studied again. So the critical thing here is that we need to be giving our students as many opportunities as possible to practice whatever it is that we're going to be doing on their assessment. If you're assessing writing, they need to be writing as part of their learning opportunities. If you're going to give a multiple choice test, they need to be taking multiple choice questions as part of their learning. Um, you also take, effect, take advantage of the testing effect in class. So we use clickers at Missouri State um, and I wish we didn't have to, they have to pay money for these, but they buy one clicker, it's for all classes for their four years at the university. Um, the reason we do that, we have classes of 330 and they say that our Wi-Fi will not support free devices for that many people. But if yours will, go free. <laughs> um, so Learning Catalytics, Kahoot, um, Inquisit, there's a lot, Poll Anywhere, those are all great ways for you to in class check in on whether or not people are understanding what you're talking about. Until I did this, you've all done this. You've, you've given your like best lecture, you gave your best example, you're like, I rocked that. And then you ask the question, everyone makes sense now? You got it? And what do you get? No. Oh no, they're like, mm-hmm, yeah. Now I never ask that question. I say, okay, now answer this question. So they answer the question and then I really get to know, did they get this or not? And about half the time, regardless of my uh, rock star lecture, they don't get it. It's hard. It's complicated. We need to do something else. But I need that feedback in the moment, and so do they. They thought they got it. They did this. But when I put a question up there, then they're like, oh, oh, maybe I don't get it. And so that's part of what we need to be doing is engaging in that testing effect. So the third one, deprocessing versus shallow processing of information. This is the best website out there. It's called www.learningscientists.org. And it gives you all kinds of ideas about how students can move from a shallow level of processing of information. Highlighting, reviewing notes, those are shallow levels of learning. And what we need to do is transfer them into a deeper level of processing the information that we're trying to get them to learn. One of the ways you do that is writing your own quiz questions. So that's why I love Maria's um, answer. Making concept maps um, is something that our students don't know how to do and something that they could learn how to do. Um, those are examples of deep processing. Here's something you might not have heard of so far, interleaving. I don't know if you guys know this term or have talked about this very much, um, but the idea about interleaving your practice versus um, blocking your practice is that we tend to give, I always think about math, 
Um, math is usually blocked in the sense of my kids come home and they have math problems to do. And it's the same kind of problem over and over if it's word problems. Apply this formula in this word problem again, 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 got it. Next night, new kind of formula, same thing. Practice, 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 practice. Here's the problem with that. When they take their math test, what happens? It's all mixed up, right? And you have to decide which formula to apply. It's an interleaved test when they practice in a blocked fashion. We often do this with our students too. Here's chapter one in a silo. And here's all the information about chapter one. And now we're gonna talk about chapter two. And I'm not gonna talk about anything else but chapter two. And then we give them an exam over chapters one through three all mixed up in there, right? So what our students and what we need to be thinking about is interleaving their work is actually incredibly effective, but it is hard. And so students, what's awesome about this, this is their judged performance versus their actual performance. Students think they will do better if they block their practice, but in actuality, they perform much better when they have interleaved their practice. So if you can bring in information, and this is what a digital environment helps us with so much, it helps us with interleaving. Um, you can, in chapter one, bring in stuff from chapters three. You can hint to something that's to come. There's lots of ways to engage in interleaved practice in a digital world, but you can also do it in your classrooms as well. So interleaving is really powerful. Um, students resist it, again, because it's uncomfortable and hard, which means it's learning, <laughs> right? And so that's why I think it's so critical to think about that. And then my number five is metacognition. Um, this has become really, really critical, I think, in the literature, and we, you've all experienced this in your students. This is the student who comes to you after they've taken an exam, and they say, I studied, I studied, I, I took the test, I thought I did really well, and I got a D. And now my response to that is, oh my goodness, you've had a metacognitive failure. <laughs> and they're like... You didn't know the <laughs> so, metacognition is your ability to know what you know and what you don't know. It's a critical skill when it comes to learning um, because when do you decide, I've got this, I'm ready to take the test? It's based on your ability to accurately assess whether or not you know that information well enough to take the test. And so our best students are really good at this. Unfortunately, the majority of our students overpredict their performance. They think they are going to do much better than they in fact do, and so therefore it actually impairs their performance because they stop preparing too soon. They do not know enough. How do we help them improve metacognition? First of all, talking about it is critical. They need to understand that this is a skill, and they need to understand if they have it or if they don't or where they need to be improving in that. And second of all, our students need immediate feedback on any type of assignment or work they do to give them metacognitive feedback. Just like I was talking about that clicker question in class, it's critical for me to know as a teacher, do they get this? But it's also critical for them sitting in the seat who just thought, I, oh yeah, I've got this, and then they get the feedback that, oh, I did not know this. And so in that moment, I'm like, if you thought you understood this, then you need to actually write a note down right now if you got this wrong, that this is something that you are still struggling with. You need to come back to it. You've got to do some more work here. So giving them that, and then Danae's going to talk about how Revel actually has immediate feedback built in, and so that really helps them with, with improving their metacognitive skills. Okay, I don't know how long I talked, but we're done.